everyone and welcome to this is the death doula global summit today we have felicity warner let me tell you a little bit about this woman felicity warner is the founder of soul midwives the largest uk-based organization offering holistic and spiritual support to the dying and their families she created the idea of soul midwifery for the dying after sitting with many hundreds of people at the end of life 25 years ago her methods have been adopted within the NHS in the UK. In 2017, she received two major UK awards for her work, End of Life Care Champion by the National Council for Palliative Care and also End of Life Doula of the Year Award. She is Honorary Knowledge Exchange Fellow at Winchester University. She runs the Soul Midwife School in the UK and is a respected lecturer, teacher, and author of four acclaimed books, Gentle Dying, A Safe Journey Home, The Soul Midwives Handbook, and Sacred Oils. Um, okay. The Soul Midwives Handbook is the textbook on holistic care of the dying used by both complementary therapists and in medical nursing schools. Welcome, Felicity Warner. Thank you so much for being here. <laughs> oh, Suzanne, <laughs> thank you so much for inviting me. This is such a wonderful gathering of like-minded souls, and I can feel the energy of that from here. So thank you for having me. <laughs> it, it, it is such an honor and a pleasure. Um, yes, it has been incredible. And again, what we're, what we're doing here is creating that global community that we have, right? So death teaches that we are touched by it, no matter who we are, no matter how much money, what, re what political party, what religion or culture. And we want to get back to that human awareness um, and soul connection. And I thought this was a great way to do that and then to spotlight some of, again, the people that have been doing this work to hear what got you into this and also where we've come from. Because I think when we look to making the future the most beautiful place that we can for everyone, we, we do have to look at where we've come from, where we are, and then what we need to do to move forward. So with that, may I ask you what brought you to this work? Yes. Um, well, first of all, to say that um, it had never been planned. Um, and so like so many other people on this path, I think we began our journey probably a long time ago without recognizing um, a beginning at the time. And for me, it was um, uh, the fact that I was brought up by my grandmother. Mm. Um, she was just the most gorgeous, lovely, fine, funny, kind woman. Mm. And I lived with her from the age of six to about 14. And we were very close, very, very close. And I had an idyllic childhood with her. Um, anyway, um, I, I need to tell you, just to describe what she was like, she was big and kind and jolly. She also smoked all the time, <laughs> like a chimney. And she loved drinking gin and tonic. Good for and, her. And she just lived life to the full. Mm. Uh, so that was great. But sadly, um, when I was sort of 13 and a half or so, she developed this horrific cough and it was lung cancer. Mm -hmm. And so what happened was that um, she had her diagnosis and did what so many people do. She hid her head in the sand like an ostrich. And I mm -hmm. think she thought, if I don't ever think about this again, it may never catch up with me. Mm -hmm. And so actually she did pretty well for quite a long time. But if, and I started doing more in the house and more cooking mm -hmm. and more looking after everything. And she started doing slightly less, mm -hmm. but eventually after about eight months, it was the inevitable was happening. And uh, she was taken into hospital there was no um, treatment that could be given to her. And I didn't see her for about six weeks. Mm. And I was taken to see her on the night she died. And oh my goodness, you just uh, can't imagine the shock and the horror of seeing someone so full of life in those very final stages. And I was taken in to see her. Um, and I remember she was in a kind of cot with all the sides lifted up and she'd shrunk into this little yeah. tiny 
tiny little person, um, almost unrecognizable, very mm. small, labored breathing and in struggling deeply. And I remember holding her foot. That was the only thing I could think of to do. I was quite fearful of everything that was going on. And she looked at me as if to say, I am so sorry. This is the end of our kind of charade we've been playing. Heartbreaking. But I think also in that moment, and it was such a grim environment she was in. Mm. It was very old fashioned. It stank of antiseptic. Right. Above her bed was this bright strip light and the right. floors were all polished. Oh, it was so sterile so, yeah. mm -hmm. and unloving. And our house had been so loving. And I remember at that minute thinking, oh, if only I could grab her and take her out of this terrible place and take her home, I would. But obviously I didn't have the of wherewithal course. to do that. But I also remember thinking to myself, as only a 14 year old can, you know, when you can feel like you can take on the whole world when you're a teenager. I remember thinking, one day I am going to make sure that people die beautifully because this should never happen. And so I think that, yeah. that literally that night, became the beginning of the journey into now what what is now this big organization <laughs> we're all over the place helping so many yes, people yes. and and you know it's still down to that one very personal experience so it's extraordinary. What, what an honor to your grandmother you oh. know I mean, and that just warms my heart so much because look at the positive effect that that had you know, that was a difficult time. And I also honor people that take painful experiences and say, what can I do to help others not go through this? I think it's so beautiful. So um, thank you so much for sharing that story with us. And let's, so you had that at 14, which is a very, very fragile time for people. Um, so how did you actually then get started on this? And what were your biggest challenges when you started out? Yeah, well, of course, there was a big leap in time then from, from that time. And actually, um, when I was a teenager, I had hoped to study medicine. I had wanted okay. to be a doctor. But um, I then went to live abroad. I went to live in Denmark. And my education was really fractured. Um, okay. And I went to live with my mother. And uh, she'd married again. But her husband suddenly dropped dead one day, age 36. Oh. And it was the most terrible experience. And strangely enough, I was able to really help support my mother because I'd already gone through a death experience before and I kind of had some scar tissue that enabled me to, to not be as fractured by it as I might have been and to really help her. Mm. So uh, that was another very formative moment. So I couldn't become a doctor or I, I didn't, but I, my next love was writing and people and sharing stories and listening to stories. So what I did was I became a journalist um, and I then specialized in uh, medical journalism. Mm -hmm. And after many years um, of doing that, I started working with young women who had had a terminal diagnosis of breast cancer. Mm. So by that time, I was in my mid thirties, early to mid thirties. And I worked with six young women who were all the same age as me. And they all knew that they weren't going to make it. Okay. Um, and so the brief for me was to talk to them, listen to their experiences, mm -hmm. hear about the treatment they were having, but but it became deeper than that. And they began yeah. sharing on a much deeper level about how it really felt to be young and to be dying. And that was really the crucial turning point in my work because I sat with them and I, there I was with one role, I was the journalist. Yeah. But I, whenever I put my notebook away, they would start telling me the deep stuff. And yeah. that really, I just knew I, I wanted to listen. I wanted to be there. I also knew that I couldn't fix or rescue. There was nothing mm -hmm. that I could do other than listen. Mm -hmm. So the listening became the work. And, um, and I just listened and listened. And then because I had a background 
uh, in a lot of complementary medicine, I started offering some just very gentle suggestions, nothing like, nothing rocket science, you know, simple stuff, lavender oil, um, breathing, some mindfulness, all that kind of thing. And it began to really, really help them. So yeah. I, after the sixth one died, so we're talking about uh, quite a, a spectrum of years it wasn't all at once I realized then I only wanted to work with the dying it was mm. the calling was so powerful and so I um I contacted the hospice where they had died and said may I come and and volunteer would there be some role I could have and they said yes because they already knew me because I'd I'd been there with these women <laughs> and they said, um, would you come and feed people? And I said, of course, I'll, I'll come and do that. And that was the beginning of, of, of entering hospice work because of course, going back then, there was no role for anybody to give care and love and tenderness. There was no role other than a clinical role. And so really this was forging into quite new territory straight away. So that was quite interesting. So I, I love so much that you say, and, and when you talk about listening, um, you know, I often will say that the power of our presence can be the best medicine at the end of life, really present yeah. with an open heart, with intention of love, with holding that, that space for that person, not fixing yeah. but really listening. And it's so beautiful that you said that. The other thing that I want to highlight, and I know that you've written this, is that, you know, death became medicalized. Yeah. And um, is death, a, and I often ask people this, is death a medical experience? And people get confused by that sometimes. And it, it's not, it's a human experience. And I think we forgot that and we've sent it away into medicine where it doesn't belong, <laughs> where you can't, you know, yes, medicine is wonderful. But yeah but it's a human experience to die. And so that's incredibly beautiful. And I love that you followed that, that you wanted to continue on that path with hospice. Aww. And then it is true. These holistic modalities are absolutely beautiful because we're holistic beings, right? Yeah. Yeah. So you started working um, with the hospice and then I know that you've started to develop this kind of, you know, work and training. So what was that path like? Well, it was very, um, to start with, it was just purely me on my own. <laughs> and I'm sure many people thought, oh, it's the mad woman that just talks about death and the importance of a good death all the time. Because even then, the idea of the concept of a good death was madness to most right. people. Yes. Death would always be terrible, Absolutely. you know, and yeah. you know, it was just something we would fight against. But yeah. I, I could see when I was with someone mm -hmm. who was having a good death, mm -hmm. how beautiful mm -hmm. that could be. Mm -hmm. And not only beautiful, it had a healing effect mm -hmm. for not only the dying person, which might sound strange, but I can quantify that, but it would also have a healing effect for their loved ones and for the entire community around them. Yes. So obviously I wasn't healing dying people, but making them feel whole again yeah. in a beautiful, holistic way, making them feel loved, making them feel safe was all part of that work and, and the vision, if you like. So I sat with so many people and all the dying people I've ever worked with are my teachers. You know, they really Absolutely. have taught me everything. Right. And, and every death is different and every person is different. Yeah. But I saw things sitting with dying people that made me open my eyes out wide. Yeah. Extraordinary things that fascinated me, yeah. such as, you know, people hanging on for yeah. someone important to come and visit yeah. or for a big event like a golden wedding or something. Yeah even though they haven't eaten or drunk for days, yeah. you know, just extraordinary. <laughs> or people, a family may vigil around the bedside for weeks and you know, mum don't go. And the minute they go out for a meeting with the doctor, the person yep. dies mm -hmm. because there's no attachment in the room and it's peaceful. Yeah. Yeah. There were so many amazing things. And it made me think, you know what? Dying is the most incredible 
experience and it's being missed by wow. all the clinical overviews on this. And you know what? As human beings, we've been looking after the dying since man began. Yeah. And we know how to do it, yeah. really. It's in our bones. Yes. <laughs> and the sad thing is that we've become a bit disempowered and a little bit frightened that we might do something wrong. Mm. So I think all the ideas that came to me sitting at the bedside, which were about as you said beautifully, Suzanne, being present, mm. deep listening and gentle therapeutic offerings mm -hmm. just made such a huge difference. So I, I carried on doing that and then came up with a model of the dying process, which wasn't anything like you have in Western medicine. <laughs> and if oh, again, I, I, was, <laughs> you know, I was seeing things and seeing these amazing psycho spiritual mm -hmm. kind of happenings and thinking, wow, this is what we need to be holding space yes. for. Because wow. this really makes a difference to people. So um, I began working out a kind of a model, um, a sort of diagnostic model of how people are at certain stages of the dying process. Yes. Yes. And that's become like the diagnostic model of soul midwifery. Mm -hmm. So everything I teach is about where your person is at. We call mm -hmm. our patients friends rather than patients. Mm -hmm. you know, where they're at, how that's impacting on them, uh, physically, spiritually, emotionally, holistically, and then how we can really support them at that time of that process and yes. really reach them in a deep place. So that's that took years, I can tell you actually, of of field work, I call it. Yeah. Bedside and talking and listening and being. So it all took a long time, but um and then I started to teach that a bit because the doctors were saying what are you doing with, you know, you're doing something that seems to be having an effect. So I started saying, well, it isn't very um, technical and it's all come from deep inside, really. It's an instinctive way of working, mm -hmm. but I'll show you. And then that started leading to more and more teaching. So, and then writing. Okay. So we're going to get to your whole wonderful platform, for sure. But I just, absolutely love everything that you just said and it really mirrors everything that that i believe in so one of the things because my background is a is a nurse in hospice and in oncology and just like you're saying there was that occasional beautiful end of life and i thought if people could see that they would never be afraid of death if they could see that it could go like that and then i went on you know the path of trying to figure out how did we get so removed from end of life even being in the awareness. Yeah. So there's this fear of death and then it became medicalized. And, and yet, ironically enough, we really don't teach our medical practitioners anything about death mm. and supporting them. So, so incredibly beautiful. And you're right. If that, we have one opportunity to do end of life well. If it goes well, people remember that forever. If it doesn't go well, they hold on to that forever. Yes. So it's so important that we get out there and share and, and that's exactly what you did. And it's incredibly powerful and beautiful. So you, you did these wonderful techniques and, and from the heart and started building and doctors were looking in and saying, um, you know, what are you doing there? And it's so interesting because for United States and I hear this in many other countries, you know, we're really f struggling with our medical system. You know, there people, they see so many patients they're, um, you know, they're not allowed to spend a lot of time with them. There's really not the holistic care because, and we see that at the end of life, right? So our patients teach us everything. It's a physical, emotional, spiritual, and mental experience. Yeah. And I love that, that it's there. So you built this incredible training and platform and it has just, you know, helped so many people. And it seemed to now be obviously in the beginning, it, it was non-medical and, and you're probably, you had to explain what you were doing, but now it seems to be accepted and, and really appreciated within the, the, yeah. So tell yeah. us about that. Yes, that's, it, it is really exciting. Um, and if I look back even over the last five or 10 years, you know, things mm. have changed so much. Mm -hmm. um, uh, last weekend, we held our 
Soul Midwives Conference. It was a fantastic gathering and we had people from all over the world joining us because we have soul midwives all over the world. Um, And it was so interesting to hear about how this work is really being brought into the mainstream and it's being valued and accepted. And in the UK, uh, we have even now got some hospitals who are working with us and they're asking soul midwives how can we make dying better and we're doing a lot of training in hospitals so that can only be good news it's 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 great great news it's great news so (laughs) what's beautiful (laughs) is that as we see kind of well and the other the other factor here is that we've never seen an aging population in history like we have now so and it's because of western medicine and different things that the life has been extended but with that our medical system is also struggling and so we have this demographic going up and we have this going down so to bring in a non-medical holistic practitioner to fill in that gap to offer that time in all settings i think is going to be embraced and that's so exciting because it's such it's such a beautiful heart-centered care that we're doing and so it helps the person the patient the friend it helps the family and it helps the medical system yeah absolutely absolutely you know where we work now with a multidisciplinary team they are astonished at how much burden we can take from a really struggling um over you know busy environment so it, it's win win really but we have to build confidence in in the work that we give and show um how it works um and that always takes time you know building a new paradigm is a is a big thing to do for us in in the united states and many places in the world it was you know we have gotten we what i always say we've outsmarted ourselves right so we think we're so smart with all this technology and everything and we we literally lost touch with the essence and foundation of what we've been doing for thousands of years this is nothing new you know we have to reclaim that and i think one of the biggest hurdles that we had um, and do probably have but it's really changing now is this non-medical that's not a government licensure that's a holistic practice um being accepted into the mainstream because everyone is like well it needs to be documented and you have to have all these rules and that's what literally ruined the system because we got so far away from the actual patient care Mm absolutely yeah. and it's the same here as well um and there's a constant tension between the 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 philosophy of giving love and tenderness and care against the sort of need to have regulation and safeguarding practices as well yeah. so yeah. it's it's a very hard um thing to bring together and synchronize but we have to just keep on going with that <laughs> and until it works. It's happening. You know, Felicity, I think it's happening because they realize that they can't supply what's needed. And also that we might have gotten a little bit carried away with all of the nonsense with regulation. Mm-hmm. Um, and so do you feel globally that we are waking up to death? And, and we can talk about COVID for a minute because I, I call and I, we understand how difficult this time has been for everyone um, globally. And I think that's also, you know, there's blessings of COVID. Uh, Identifying that we are in this together, this thing in the world, right? And no matter where you are, even in the high mountains of Thailand, you know, there was COVID shutdown, you know, in every little corner of the world. And that it, it brought the awareness that death, if it was optional before, if we could pretend it wasn't, you know, a part of the journey, is a part of the journey. So do you think that we are waking up to this thing called end of life globally? And yeah, we'll talk about the benefits of that. I do. I think it's a huge and pivotal moment um, for uh, growing awareness and understanding of, of death globally. And also with that comes an opening for the work that we are all doing as as soul midwives, doula, doulas, whatever, you know, mm. it's we're we're so different than we were even a year ago. You know, mm. people are people are talking about death for a start because yeah. 
they're having to, you know, it's all around us. And so I think our work is a huge part is, is, is about talking about death with people, not just looking after the dying, but it's opening the conversations. Yeah. So I, I love that because I often will tell people that coming in at the end to support somebody is so beautiful, but that's not the answer completely. It's, talking about it now it's bringing death awareness just like we would talk about life yeah. having that be a common and also when we're aware that one day our life's journey will come to an end as we know it don't we focus on the day very differently oh and yes it teaches you know <laughs> i say that death is our best teacher about life and yet we've put yeah. that resource we've shoved it away in our yes. world right Mm. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more with you. You know, it is working with death every day as we do. Yes. It teaches us mm. about living. Yeah. <laughs> and that's the great kind of the paradox of it. Yes. But, and that's the beauty of it as well, is it gives you such focus on really, really making the most of every day that we have in every moment. And if you yeah. think about it, yeah, if you think about it, we've, we've kind of put off our elderly and also end of life, we've outsourced it. So we're missing, in my opinion, one of the greatest opportunities and tools about how to live for everyone that it's not, it's not a surprise that there's so much chaos in the yeah. world. We're kind of, you know, our resources, but, but we're bringing that back, right? So we're bringing back the awareness, which is beautiful. Yeah. So knowing that uh, doula trainings, can you just share a little bit more about your specific training? Cause I know that so many people are interested in taking it. Oh yes. Well, um, well, I, <laughs> I run a school, mm-hmm. um, and it's, it's, um, it's a school that caters for all bits of all aspects of end of life care. So, uh, we, we do our basic soul midwifery training mm-hmm. and you can either come and do that face to face or we do a distance program, which is all written assignments, or we do live zoom trainings now, which is just amazing. That has gone wow crazy and it's beautiful so that's really good um and that's that's our sort of standard training so you're a safe pair of hands at the bedside um then we also have a deeper training a level two which is much more about uh the more esoteric and spiritual aspects of death and dying um and that Again, uh, many, many people come and train with us with that. And then I teach about um, uh, using voice, using music, using touch, using Mm -hmm. celebrancy at the bedside, all manner of that we teach at the school, which is great fun. Um, And um, and also online. So that's that's that. Basically, it's about, um, as I said before, understanding what people are going through during the process of dying Mm -hmm. and then matching that with a set of very simple therapeutic techniques, which we then teach our students how to use um and, and that's and the theoretical aspects of dying as well and the practical things advocacy and um what to actually do when somebody dies all that sort of thing as well so uh, we work with people uh, from the day of diagnosis potentially mm-hmm. right through to the end when we'll vigil and even a little bit longer than that because we always say that our dying people just because the last breath has been taken and the heart has stopped it doesn't mean we pack our bag away we have a quiet time of reflection and holding space just absolutely as a, yeah you'll understand exactly what i'm saying absolutely. but that's really important as well so uh that, and families find that really helpful too. Yeah. Absolutely. It sounds absolutely beautiful. I love it so much. Um, oh, yeah. So in your opinion, what could bringing back death awareness on a global level do to raise up our humanity? If we can bring this and successfully so, and again, COVID is helping with that awareness um, that death will touch us all. But if we can really engage in this moment and support one another, what do you think that could potentially do to raise up our global family? Well, it's a huge question that, but I think 
in some ways I can distill that into an essence which is all about teaching about the power of compassion and love and tender caregiving and I I I that is so deep within my heart and I'm sure you've found this too but sometimes when I'm working with a dying person who maybe has no family or friends or loved ones left it's astonishing how the power of giving them love and care affects them. And I feel so sad sometimes that they've had to wait till they're dying to receive that amount of love and care. So my hope is that we can really raise that vibration of tender loving care and offer it out to everybody and make that the norm. <laughs> I love it. And I am with you on that. And we will, oh. and I, I agree. It is very magical. The end of life, that connection, that presence, that compassion. Let's bring that into today. Not wait till the end. Yeah. How can people get in touch with you and learn more about your practice? Okay. Um, so, um, I have a, a website, uh, so it's, uh, www.soulmidwives.co.uk okay. and if you go onto that you will see a section which is all about the school and the training there's also a section about me and the books because I write books about death and dying as you said um, and about various events going on and also the work I do with sacred oils which is a very old practice using aromatic oils for the dying so that it's all there on that website and I love hearing from people and I also have a YouTube channel just started on on soul midwives so it is there um have a look and I shall be busy making some more uh videos to go on it when I get a moment to do oh, that oh how exciting that is wonderful <laughs> Felicity Warner you are such a gift to this world and I want to thank you so much for everything that you have done and I cannot wait to meet you in person and take some of your courses you are just lovely thank you so very much oh thank you so much for having me I've loved talking to you it's been a joy and I send my love to all the the doulas all around the world as well thank you so very much Felicity Warner Thank you, everyone. This was, again, the Death Doula Global Summit. My name is Susanne O'Brien. We will see you in the next interview. Bye, everybody.